Welcome to the first lesson. In this lesson, we will discuss the key areas of SEO, known as on-page optimization, technical SEO, and off-site SEO. After this lesson, you will be able to define all of these focus areas, and then you will learn the role these play in the art of optimizing a website and specific strategies to help your website rank higher in search engines. The optimization of a website is divided into three key areas, which we will cover over the next few lessons and modules. This will allow you to gain an in-depth understanding of the tactics needed to create a full SEO strategy. The three main areas you will hear about in the SEO world are on-page optimization, technical optimization, also referred to as on-site optimization, and off-page or off-site optimization. On-page optimization is the practice of optimizing elements of a page or a group of pages throughout a site to improve the SEO of the site as a whole. We call this on-page because we focus on various elements within a page or the code of a page. This refers to the content on the page, keyword choice for the page, and optimizing the page's metadata. Technical or on-site optimization refers to the more technical aspects of improving the website as a whole. This goes beyond keywords and content and looks at how well the site is seen and understood by search engines. With a technical SEO strategy, we would look at and make recommendations to improve the code used within the site, the structure of the site, and more. Technical SEO is important because while you can make the best on-page improvements to your site, it won't make a difference if search engines cannot find or understand the improvements that you made. Off-site SEO or off-page SEO refers to what actions you can take outside of your website to improve optimization of your website. This is where SEO gets very similar to public relations because it can be very focused on developing good relationships with other webmasters. Off-site SEO has historically referred to acquiring links from other websites pointing to your website. But this area is quickly growing to encompass social media and other off-site elements as well. You should now have an understanding of the three major focus areas of an optimization strategy, on-page, off-page, and technical, and you should be able to define each focus area and how each work to create a better optimized website. Welcome back. Now that you understand the separate focus areas of SEO, this lesson will introduce core concepts regarding on-page SEO that you will need to understand before moving on to more in-depth topics. When you look at a search result, are you able to understand all of the components of the result? After this lesson, you will be able to understand what metadata and meta tags mean, as well as analyze the search result and recognize the individual metadata elements. Before we begin, let's discuss the anatomy of a search result. When you perform a search in a search engine, you will get a page of results that look like this. This is a single result from the page. In this search result, I have colored each individual area so you can better spot what areas I'm referring to as I speak. Each of the areas you see here are related to SEO and are areas we focus on in our on-page optimization process. When referring to all of these areas together, they are known as a site's metadata, but each individual area has its own name. The term metadata basically means data that describes other data. Each page of a website contains an area of metadata. This area is made up of individual meta tags. These individual meta tags are small snippets of text that helps search engines identify important information about the page, such as what the page is about or whether or not search engine robots should ignore the page. This information is contained within the source code of a page, which means it is not publicly viewable unless you specifically view the code that makes up the page. In the source code, each page has a head element, which is a container for metadata and is located at the top of a page. Let's go back to our first example so we can view the various metadata elements. This is a search result for the UC Davis Winemaking Certificate Program. 
To get this result to display, I searched Google for online winemaking course. Let's take a moment to examine this result. The area in blue is what we call the title tag. The title tag describes the title or name the webmaster gave to this specific page. The area in green is the website address or URL of the page. This isn't actually part of the metadata that you can define. Search engines will pull the URL from the page it is analyzing. The text underneath is the meta description, which is a block of text describing the content you will find on the page. Note that within the meta description, some words are bolded. These words are bolded because they match the words we used in our search query. These words are what we call keywords. You can see that all of the keywords do not need to appear together in order to be bolded. So my search for online winemaking course also bolded the word courses because Google can recognize the plural version of course as well as the words online and winemaking. Note that in this sentence here, the word class is also bolded. This is because Google recognizes that courses and class are semantically related. When we refer to metadata, we are referring to the various elements that encompass the way this search result is displayed. Let's take a bit of a deeper look at the individual elements. You should now be able to define metadata as well as look at a search result and recognize individual metadata elements. Welcome back. One of the meta tags that we looked at in the last lesson is the meta tag called the title tag. In this lesson, we'll explore the title tag in depth. How do you find the title tags for websites in search results, browsers, and the source code of a website? We'll explore how to discover all of these and what strong title tags can do in terms of SEO. We'll also look at how to make an optimized title tag by considering the best practices and analyzing examples. Let's get started. The title tag, which is highlighted in the example provided, is a major component of your on-page optimization strategy. When optimizing a website, you want to make sure that each page of the site includes a title tag optimized for SEO following the best practices laid out in this lesson. The title tag not only displays in the search results like we saw previously, but will also display at the top of your browser tab when viewing the page. You may have to hover your mouse cursor over the title to see the full title display. If you look at the source code, you can also see where the title is. I will take a moment to show you how to locate the title tag on the site, within the source code, and using browser add-ons. In this demonstration, I will show you how you can identify the title tag of a page. You can identify the title tag in a couple of different ways. The first way is looking at the top of your browser and finding the text within this area. If you hover your mouse over this area, you'll get a pop-up and the text displayed here is the page's title tag. You can also locate the title tag by right-clicking anywhere on the page and choosing the option View Source. This will pop up another page showing the page's source code. You'll find an area here that says title and an area here that has a forward slash and title. This means that the text in between these two tags is the title tag. You can see the text, you can see the title tag here, which I've highlighted. Another way of viewing the title tag is through browser add-ons. For this example, I'll use the Moz bar. If you're using the Moz bar, simply click on the magnifying glass, click on page elements, and find the page title here. The Moz bar will also show you the number of characters within the title tag. That concludes how to view the title tag of a page. The title tag has long been regarded as one of the most important on-page elements to optimize. The most important on-page element is actually the content of your page, 
but the title tag holds high importance as well. You want your title tag to accurately and concisely describe your page while containing keywords users are likely to search for. It is recommended to place the keywords or information describing the page at the front of the title tag and the brand name at the end of the title tag. This is for both user experience and SEO purposes. From an SEO standpoint, Google places more importance on the words at the beginning of the title tag than at the end. Many tests have shown that placing keywords closer to the start of your title tag gives a better boost to rankings. From a user experience standpoint, the information describing your page is the first thing a user will read and can lead to an improved click-through from search results. There are some instances where it would be recommended to place brand name first, and this is mainly when the company really wants to leverage their branding. If it's a very well-known brand, they might see a higher click-through if the brand name comes before the description. However, if you have a small, less well-known brand, the best solution is keeping it at the end. For the most part, even for well-known brands, we generally recommend placing the name last. Unless the company is really concerned with branding, I suggest making the recommendation to keep the brand at the end of the title tag. In the previous example from UC Davis, their title tag used a description of the page, which was winemaking certificate program. You can also use individual keywords rather than a descriptive phrase. For example, if you owned a site, let's just say Widget Mart, and wanted to optimize your page, which sold blue widgets, you could use individual keywords instead. In this case, you should separate your keywords with hyphens. For example, you may make your title tag blue widgets for sale hyphen buy blue widgets and then your brand name widget mark. I recommend making sure each title tag is no longer than 60 characters in length. In fact, it's best to try to keep title tags around 55 characters just to be safe. While search engines will read title tags longer than 60 characters, additional characters will get cut off in search results and can lead to a poor user experience, which can impact visits to your site. In the second title tag example shown here, you can see that the webmaster has used the name of the course for the title tag. In this case, the name is far too long and leads to an unappealing search result and can impact click-through to the site. To keep your title tag short and concise, make sure you are only using the most important keyword or keywords for your page. It is recommended you do not focus on more than two keywords in the title tag. This not only helps cut down on length, but ensures you have a tight keyword focus for that page, making it more relevant for the keyword and easier to rank. Let's revisit some of the best practices we've discussed for title tags. The title tag should be 55 characters or less. It can be up to 60 characters in length. You can make it longer, but the additional characters will not be displayed in search results and may be cut off. This doesn't look appealing to users and may impact click-through to your site. The words at the very beginning of your title tag are given the most weight. So when possible, try to put important keywords at the front of your title tag. Brand or company names should be at the end, like the UC Davis extension is displayed in the example provided. Generally, people differentiate between what the page is about and the brand by using the pipe symbol before the brand name, like the example shown. If you are using multiple keywords in a title tag, it is best to separate those with hyphens. For example, if UC Davis wanted to use the keywords winemaking course and learn winemaking, a way to form that title tag would be winemaking course hyphen learn winemaking pipe symbol UC Davis extension. It's best to avoid special characters. I recommend trying to stick with alphanumeric characters as some browsers or search engines may not display special characters correctly. If you have a longer brand name, you can also consider shortening it or abbreviating it. For example, if UC Davis Extension wanted to shorten their name, 
they might use UC Davis EXT. Oftentimes, this falls under the company's branding guidelines, which state how the name should be displayed on all public-facing material. This is a great question to ask your clients when working on an SEO strategy. It's also a good idea to educate them about the benefits of shortening it, because a lot of times they have a preference for the full name, but upon learning the benefits of shortening it, will agree to do so. Now that you understand more about the process of optimizing title tags, take a moment to craft one yourself. You can see that this page on UC Davis Extension's website doesn't have a very great title tag. In this example, the title tag is too long and it doesn't really have great keyword usage. Very few people are likely to search for a phrase like website design professional concentration. I have provided a link to this page in your course material. Take a look at the page and create a better title tag for the page following the title tag best practices we just discussed. Explain why you made the changes you did. In addition, create your own title tag for a page and website of your choosing. Provide the link to the page you created the title tag for and explain why you made the changes you did. When you are done, you will be asked to review another classmate's title tag. When reviewing a classmate's title tag, look to make sure they made the following changes. Is the title tag different than the initial title tag? Is the entire title tag, including brand name, less than 60 characters in length? Does the title tag include the brand name? Is the brand name separated from the keywords using a pipe symbol? Does the title tag contain a phrase or keyword you or a friend might search for if you are looking for information about this subject? If more than one keyword is used, are these keywords separated by hyphens? You should now understand what a title tag is and where to locate the title tag in the search results, the browser, and in the source code of a website. In addition, you should be able to craft an optimized title tag following SEO best practices. Let's move on. Now that you understand the title tag, we'll move on to another meta tag, the meta description. Since meta description keywords don't help a site rank, this can be overlooked in SEO, but we'll look at how this can be used to direct website traffic. Once you fully understand the purpose of the meta description, you'll see how to best use it for an on-page optimization strategy. As a refresher, the meta description is the block of text under the title and URL. This block of text describes what the page is about. It is also important to know how to locate the meta description when you are viewing the site. I will provide a quick demonstration. In this demonstration, I will show you how to locate the meta description of a page. Unlike the title tag, the meta description cannot be seen on the page or within the browser. This area is hidden to the viewer and only displays publicly in the search results. For example, this is a page for UC Davis winemaking certificate program. Under this result here, you can see the meta description of the result. To discover the meta description of the page itself, you can either look at the source code or use a browser add-on. To view the meta description in the source code, right-click anywhere on the page and then choose View Page Source. This will open up a tab displaying the source code of the page you are viewing. You can locate the meta description here where it says meta name equals description. Next to that, you'll see content equals. This tells search engines that information after the equal sign here is part of the meta description. Sometimes websites will not contain a meta description, and if this is the case, the page may still include a meta description tag, but no content will exist within the tag. Sometimes they won't include a meta description tag at all. The next way we can locate the meta description is by using a browser add-on. In this example, I'm going to use the Moz bar. To locate the meta description, 
Click on the magnifying glass and choose Page Elements. You'll be able to locate the meta description here and then see the content within the meta description. You can also see the number of characters that exist within the meta description content. You may notice that this meta description does not match the meta description we just viewed in search results. If Google believes this area is not well optimized, for example, maybe it's not relevant to a query or maybe it's too long, Google may choose their own meta description to show users. You should now be able to locate the meta description within search results, in the source code of a website, or by using a browser add-on. Unlike the title tag, keywords within the meta description will not help a site rank better for those keywords. Due to this, some people are under the misconception that optimizing this area is not helpful to their SEO strategy. However, while search engines will not look for keywords within the meta description for ranking purposes, the meta description does help support your SEO strategy. A well-crafted meta description has been found to increase click-through to your website. That means it influences how likely a user is to click on your result instead of a competitor's. Do you recall how the keywords we used were bolded within the meta description? This helps to draw the eye to that particular result. It lets us know that the page contains exactly what we're looking for. By writing a meta description and using keywords that you think a user is likely to search for, more of the words within that description will be bolded. Meta descriptions should contain information about the page that entices a user to click, while also naturally incorporating keywords they might use while performing a search. You want the meta description to accurately describe the content. For example, if you just included a list of keywords and no real content, most of the keywords would not end up bolded since only a selection of the keywords a user typed in would become bold, and then the meta description wouldn't make sense to users. Meta descriptions should also have a character limit. In this example, you can see how the meta description is cut off, indicating that there is more to read that didn't fit within the space provided. This can lead to a poor user experience, so it is recommended to keep meta descriptions under 160 characters in length. Remember when we were viewing the meta description in the screencast? The meta description used was 415 characters in length, which is way too long. For this page, Google has decided to provide its own meta description based on the content on the page. This may be due to the existing description's excessive length. It's important to try to use as many characters as possible without exceeding 160. If your meta description is too long, it will either not be used or get cut off like the example above. If the meta description is too short, this can impact click-through to your site. When search engines decide to create their own meta description, they will usually take a block of text from the page that includes keywords the user searched for. The text they choose may not best highlight what the page is about. Search engines will usually take a full block of text, even if it exceeds 160 characters, so this may create an unappealing result. It's a good idea to control this area to ensure you present the best information possible. In cases where you aren't sure which keywords are best to include, or if your page is a broad focused topic around multiple keywords, it may be best to let Google choose the meta description for you. This is because they will always include appropriate bolded keywords. For pages like blog posts, people tend to let Google write the description for them, and that's okay. However, for static pages and articles like this example, it's fairly easy to guess what someone will be searching for. In this example, they'll be searching for keywords related to winemaking and the word course or certificate. In this case, it may be best to highlight exactly what you want to share about the program right away. By writing your own meta description, instead of letting search engines decide, you are in control of the content displayed 
and have the opportunity to describe your page the way you want to. Since you know more about your content than search engines do, you will be able to provide a better description of the page than search engines can. You should try to use words that really describe the value of the content and entice users to click. In addition to describing your content and including keywords, it's also a good idea to include a call to action. Calls to action have been found to increase click-through from search results to your site. A call to action basically requests the user to perform a specific action, such as visiting your page. When website visitors are faced with calls to action telling them exactly what you want them to do, they are more inclined to take that action. Including words like learn more, read our article to discover, find out, or download here or watch our video can help get that visit. Another great reason to optimize this area is that social networks use this as a description of the page when you or another user posts that page's link to a social network. When you don't have a meta description, social media sites will choose their own text. This text is usually just the first text seen on the page. And if that doesn't happen to be the most catchy and memorable piece of information you want to share, people are unlikely to visit your site. Also note that social media sites will also pull in the title, which is another reason to optimize that area. Let's revisit some of the best practices we've discussed about meta descriptions. An optimized meta description should contain a couple elements. The meta description looks better if the end is not cut off due to length. Avoid going past 160 characters. I try to stay somewhere in between 150 and 160 characters in length, which provides good length while also remaining under the character cutoff limit. It's a good idea to include keywords where you can. This will draw attention to your meta description when words used within the search query are bolded. It's also a best practice to include a call to action. Calls to action can improve the click through to your page. A call to action is basically a sentence telling the reader what they should do next. For example, a good call to action for the winemaking course might be click here to learn the art of making wine, or enroll in our online winemaking certification course. Avoid using quotations or special characters whenever possible. Quotations specifically will cause your meta description to be cut off. For your next assignment, take a look at the UC Davis winemaking certification page and create a new meta description following the best practices we discussed. Next, Create a meta description for a page and website of your choosing following SEO best practices. Describe why you created the meta description you did for each of your examples, and be sure to include a link to the example site of your choice. You will be asked to review another peer's work. When you are doing so, make sure they have completed the following. Have they included a link to the example site they used? Is the meta description between 150 and 160 characters? Does the meta description contain words that people are likely to use when searching for this topic? Does the meta description contain a call to action? By now, you should have a clear understanding of what the meta description is, the importance of the meta description in generating visits to your site, and how to best optimize the meta description to increase click-through from search results to your website. Welcome back. Since you are now well-versed in title tags and meta descriptions, I want to give you a brief note about another meta tag, the meta keywords tag. Meta keywords were previously a major component of an SEO strategy, but now they are only used in certain circumstances. I'll discuss the history so that you can familiarize yourself with this concept and its original purpose. This will be useful for clients who may still ask about the meta keywords tag, as well as how they're still currently used by search engines like Baidu in China. In our past lessons, we discussed metadata and important meta tags. Another meta tag area to discuss 
is the Meta Keywords tag. This area is no longer a focus of SEO. You may still hear clients ask about this. A lot of content management systems will still have areas for the metadata, which include the Meta Keywords tag. Many, many years ago, this tag was important to SEO. Search engines did not have the same capabilities of analyzing the content of a page as they do today. Due to this, they had a difficult time trying to determine what a page was about. This resulted in the birth of the Meta Keywords tag, a snippet of information used to provide search engines with information about what that particular page should rank for. As one might expect, however, over time, the area was not used responsibly and webmasters would stuff this area full of keywords. This resulted in many pages ranking that were not always the best result for a user's search query. This created a poor user experience. As search engine algorithms improved, the meta keywords tag became defunct. This is no longer necessary to use. Unlike the meta description, which can still be seen even though it doesn't impact rankings, the meta keywords tag is not seen by users. Due to this, it has zero impact and is best left alone. You will occasionally hear people mention that some search engines may still use the meta keywords tag, but it is very rarely the case. In 2014, Bing's senior product manager, Dwayne Forrester, wrote a great blog post explaining the demise of the meta keywords tag and how it can't help your site. This can be accessed at the link provided in your study materials. I suggest you read through that. You should note, however, that some international search engines, such as China's search engine Baidu, will still use this tag, but the information entered has to be in Chinese. Unless you are doing a lot of international SEO on foreign search engines, you can feel safe leaving out the meta keywords tag. You should now understand the history behind the meta keywords tag and why it is no longer used. Welcome to the lesson on URLs. While you may be familiar with these as an internet user, you'll now have the opportunity to learn how to optimize URLs according to SEO best practices, including the use of keywords, subdirectories, and parameters. We will look at when there are opportunities to change URLs, as well as when it is best to leave URLs as they are. Let's delve into what a URL means. A URL is basically an address that loads a particular site or document. URLs describe a page to both visitors and search engines. Like important metadata elements, the URL should be relevant and contain important keywords while remaining brief. Also note, how the keyword winemaking in the URL has been bolded. The URL is cut off due to character limits, but ideally, it's a good idea to place important keywords as close to the beginning of your URL as possible. Keywords in the URL used to play a large role in SEO, but this has been over-optimized to a point where Google has changed the importance of URL keywords when determining where a site should rank. Keywords within the URL are still useful they just do not play as large of a role as they used to. However, URLs should also be considered from an off-page SEO perspective. If people are linking to a particular page using the URL as the link, the URL can serve as its own anchor text, and keywords within that URL might help the page be seen as relevant for those keywords. For example, if we look at the full URL for the UC Davis program, this page might be seen more relevant for words like study and winemaking and certificate, which all point to an overall theme for this page. When looking at this URL, you can see various forward slashes containing information. For example, areas of study and winemaking. These are subfolders, also known as subdirectories, which help to categorize documents on a site. When search engines display the URL, they will generally cut out the middle categories or subfolders to make the URL shorter and easier for viewers to read. You can see this in the example search result where I highlighted the area that Google removed. If important keywords are included within the subdirectories, 
part of the subdirectory name might be included in the search results. This will be bolded, which will help draw attention to the result. For example, if I searched for how to make wine, I see that one of the top results links to a site called Dan Murphy's. If I look at that URL, I can see two of the subdirectories are included. Both of these have bolded keywords with the keyword wine. When analyzing the URL, we can see that the entire subdirectory wine was included because of the keyword used. And then part of the subdirectory more about wine was included, but only the keyword wine is listed as this keyword is specific to our search query. Then you can see the entire last part of the URL, which would be displayed as normal, but has been cut off slightly due to length. However, the last part of the URL is bolded as well, which helps capture attention. While we are looking at this URL, I would also like to point out the long combination of letters and numbers at the end, which I have highlighted. These are called parameters, and where possible, it's best to leave these out of your URLs. Parameters not only make your URLs excessively long, but oftentimes the parameter can change based on a variety of factors. This particular parameter is a session ID, which means it changes based on the user. If you were to Google how to make wine and you found the site and clicked on the result, your URL would be slightly different than the one I have here. This can create problems with duplicate content as the URL has changed, but the content has remained the same. Unless we as SEOs have been brought in during the design stages of a website, which is unfortunately a rare occurrence, we have little to say in how URLs are displayed and what subdirectories are created. You can always change the URL after the fact, but remember, that page is likely already ranking under the existing URL. Changing it later would mean it would lose some of the history and authority it has built up. If a URL is changed, it is best to ensure it is redirected using a 301 or permanent redirect. Once that occurs, it would take time for Google to remove the old URL from the index and index the new one. Due to this, changing URLs for the sake of SEO is not always the best option. Recommendations to do so can be very situational. Oftentimes, it is better to optimize the page and other on-page elements to the best of your ability and leave the URL as it is. The decision to change existing URLs, whether during a redesign or for SEO purposes, is circumstantial and should be heavily considered before making a change just for SEO. However, this knowledge will come in handy when working with clients to create new pages or in cases where you are building your own site or working with a client to build theirs. Whenever you are creating a new page, Follow the best practices we have discussed to create an optimal URL. Let's review some of the best practices for URLs. Don't change URLs for the sake of changing them. If you do have to change a URL, always redirect that to a new page using a permanent 301 redirect. It's always best to optimize the URL from the start. Incorporate keywords into the URL where possible. Incorporate keywords into subdirectories where possible. Keep URLs short and succinct. You should now have an understanding of what a URL is and be able to locate subdirectories within the URL. In addition, you should have an understanding of how to optimize a URL with SEO in mind and how to optimize URLs for a new site or a redesign. You should also be able to identify opportunities to change URLs as well as when to leave URLs as they are. Hello again. Headings. They're used in documents and papers to help organize them. While that is also the case for a web page, the heading tags are also important for SEO. In this lesson, you'll learn the difference between types of heading tags and their importance. From this, you'll be able to identify heading tags as well as be able to make recommendations for improving them to a client. Documents you write, as well as web pages, have headings. You have a primary heading, referred to as an H1, or less frequently as Heading 1, 
and subheadings referred to as H2, H3, and so forth. Heading tags not only help to stylistically break up the content on the page, but are also useful for SEO. Search engines will look at the heading tags on a page to better determine what the page is about and the page's structure. From an SEO standpoint, the H1 tag is the most important of the heading tags, and then H2 tags are somewhat important. In the grand scheme of things, these are both small signals, but it never hurts to have the heading tags optimized with keywords as long as it sounds natural and not written for robots. If you are unable to naturally incorporate keywords that reinforce the title tag of the page and the page's theme, it's best to leave it out. Subsequent heading tags like H3 and so forth are not really looked at by search engines from an SEO standpoint. So we usually only address H1s and H2s with clients. It's a good idea to stick to one H1 per page and then use H2s as subsequent heading tags as needed. Don't include multiple unnecessary heading tags on one page just to include keywords, as this can make a page appear spammy. You can view what elements of the page are H1 and H2 tags by viewing the source code or by using a browser add-on. I personally like Moz's add-on, but you can find any that works best for you. When you start examining headings of a page, you will often find that a portion of the text that looks like it should be an H1 or an H2 is not. You may also find that some elements of the page are coded as a heading when they really shouldn't be. Our job as SEOs is to review the page and make recommendations on where to adjust the heading tags and how to best incorporate keywords into the heading tags where possible. I'm going to take a brief moment to show how you can identify heading tags within a page. In this demonstration, we will walk through how you can identify heading tags on a page. There are a couple of different ways you can view heading tags on a page. For example, if you want to know whether or not a specific area of text is correctly coded as a heading tag, one way to find out is to highlight that section of text, right click, and then choose inspect element. This will provide you with a view of the specific section of the source code of the page. In this case, we can see that the text we are looking at, winemaking certificate program, is correctly wrapped in an H1 tag. If you want to see all of the heading tags on a page without having to highlight individual pieces of text individually, you can view the entire source code. To do so, right click anywhere on the page and then select View Page Source. A window showing the source code of the page will pop up. This isn't a very popular method as there's a lot of information within the source code which can make it difficult to find what you want to look for. To find heading tags, you can always just perform a search for the type of heading you are looking for. For this example, I'll press Ctrl F since I'm on a PC and then type in H1. The first H1 it brings me to shows me that the H1 is the site name. To view additional H1s, I can press Enter and then cycle through additional H1s on the page. The next one brings me to the H1 we were examining earlier, Winemaking Certificate Program. If I press Enter again, it brings me right back to the first H1 we just saw, which means these are the only two H1 tags on the page. The next method is using a browser add-on. In this example, I'll use the Moz bar. To view the heading tags, I can click on the magnifying glass and then select Page Elements. I can see the H1 here and the text of those H1s here under Content. In general, you really only want or need H1 H1 per page. And in this case, since the first H1 is the site name, which is going to be the same across all pages within the site, this is creating duplicate content and isn't providing any value. If this were a client, we would recommend that they remove the site name as the H1. One of the downfalls of the Moz bar is that it only picks up one H2 tag. We can see 
that the H2 tag it's picking up in this case is secondary menu, which isn't an optimal H2. One of the recommendations we would make would be to remove the H2 tag from this area as it's not helpful to SEO and menus do not need to be wrapped in heading tags. If we go to the page itself and look at code behind the second heading here, learn the science behind the art of winemaking, we can inspect this and we will see that this is an H2 tag as well. This H2 is much more optimal. If we were to inspect these additional heading tags, such as about the program, estimated cost, how to apply, we would see that each of these areas are all H2s. In some cases, you can naturally incorporate keywords within these heading tags. For example, instead of just saying about the program, you might want to change this to about the winemaking certification program. You wouldn't want to do this for every H2, but having one or two additional instances of keywords on the page is a good idea as long as it sounds natural. That wraps up this demonstration on how to find heading tags on a page. So after reviewing that page, we already have some recommendations we can provide to the client. Remove the H1 from the site name, remove the H2 from the menu, incorporate a keyword into the second H2 tag, add H3 tags to subheadings near the bottom of the page. Your assignment for this lesson is to select two different sites of your own choosing. Look at the homepage of the site and any interior page you want. Find the H1 and the H2 of these pages if they exist. If the page has multiple H1s, list those. List any recommendations you have for improving the H1 and the H2. You should now have an understanding of the different types of heading tags on a page and the importance of each within an on-page optimization strategy. You should be able to identify heading tags on a page, as well as the type of heading tags you are looking at. In addition, you should be able to make recommendations for improving heading tags within the page, whether this is adding heading tags, removing heading tags, or incorporating keywords into existing headings. Creating unique content is important not only for search engine optimization, but also for user experience. This lesson will clarify the importance of quality content as well as how to maximize that content. We'll discuss integrating keywords in unique content and how to use links effectively. You'll learn the best practices for content optimization and how to avoid duplicating content. By the end of this lesson, you'll know how to develop a clear content strategy for a client. Without content, your page will be hard pressed to rank well. Your page needs quality content around the topic or theme of your page. Ideally, this content will include the focus keyword of the page and related keywords. However, it is important to focus on quality content where keywords fit naturally into the copy rather than force the keywords into the copy, which can sound unnatural. Recommendations for improving content is situational, as all sites are different. However, there are some best practices to follow for all sites. This may be obvious, but it's important to make sure your content is relevant to the theme of your site. If you have an article that doesn't match the topics and keywords you normally use, this article won't be seen as relevant and will not rank as well. In addition, the content should be well organized within subdirectories so search engines and users can locate and identify content most relevant to the specific topic they're searching for. For example, if you had a site about movie reviews, you wouldn't want to just place all movie reviews in the same area. It would be best to organize these in some way, such as by genre. This way users looking for reviews about dramas or comedies can easily discover what they are looking for. Another thing to be aware of is the importance of unique content. Copying content from elsewhere and placing it on your site will not help your site to rank. In fact, having little to no unique content may result in a penalty. If you want to quote text from elsewhere, that's fine, 
but surround what you are quoting with your own content so the page presents a unique perspective. It's also a good idea to link back to the page you are quoting. Generally, in instances where duplicate content is a concern, Google will give credit to the first site that published that content. So if you have a website and someone copies your content, you do not have to be worried about a penalty because you posted it first. Duplicate content doesn't always mean content that matches the content of another site. You should also be aware of duplicating content within your own site. Make sure each page is unique and offers value to your readers. Keep in mind that copying a page and changing a few words to make it unique is still going to be seen as largely duplicated. For example, if you owned a plumbing site and you serviced multiple cities and wanted to make sure you had a page targeting each of those locations, make sure the content on each of those pages is unique. It would be a bad idea to copy the content to a new page and then just change the location name, thinking this would differentiate the content. If a page on your site is a duplicate of another page of your site, these two pages will compete with one another in search and cannibalize your efforts. In addition to avoiding duplicate content, you should also make sure your content is unique in that it adds something of value other similar pages or articles do not. Think about how you might be able to include new information or present the information a little differently than other websites have to add a unique spin. For example, you might want to include a video, a series of images, or other material to make your content stand out and offer more value to the reader than similar articles would. Remember, Google likes providing results that they think will be useful for users. If your page just consists of a giant block of text, no matter how well written, it will not be viewed as useful as a page which incorporates other resources, such as images. Where possible, include resources like images, video, downloadable items, and links to other useful resources, even if they're not on your own domain. By linking out to other domains, you are showing Google that your site provides value by presenting users with answers that meet their needs. When you do link out to other sites, make sure that the site is not spammy and is actually useful to the reader. It is also a good idea to break up your keyword use throughout the article. This should occur naturally as you write. For example, if you were writing an article about movie reviews, you would want to mention movies in some areas and reviews in others. You do not always need the full phrase movie reviews unless it occurs naturally. Using too many instances of a keyword, movie reviews, would start sounding repetitive and unnatural. This might be seen as spam and could potentially result in a penalty. Whenever you read your content, read it out loud and see if it sounds natural to the human ear. It's a good idea to get the opinion of a friend or coworker. Google will also look at synonyms. For example, do you only use the word movies or are there related words like film or cinema? If you change up your wording throughout the article, this will help the article sound more natural while still incorporating similar keywords. Also, consider topical associations. For example, if you are reading an article about movies, you might expect to see words related to movies like entertainment, popcorn, or theater. This will help reinforce the theme of your article. If the content you are writing is closely related to another page on your site, you should link to other relevant pages the user will find useful. This not only ensures your content is user-friendly by ushering readers through content that answers their queries, but will also aid search engines in crawling and discovering new content on your site. Where possible, link to other content using anchor text within the article. The anchor text should be related to the topic at hand and use keywords the page you are linking to is targeting. For example, if you are linking from a page about comedy movies, to a page about romantic comedies, you wouldn't want to say, click here. Instead, you'd want to link the text that says romantic comedy movie reviews to the page itself. To review, optimized content should be relevant and well-organized, 
unique and adds value that other similar sites do not. You should not repeat your keyword too often as this will appear over-optimized and stuffed. This can result in an over-optimization penalty. Instead of only using an exact keyword, try to use synonyms. Pay attention to the reading level of your content. There are tools online which will grade the reading level of a page. Try to match the reading level to that of your audience. This will aid in user friendliness, which will help your SEO. Link to other related web pages or articles within your content. Add images and other resources where applicable. For your next assignment, find an article on the subject of your choice and rate the content based on the best practices we discussed. Answer the following questions. How relevant is the content to the theme of the site? Does it include useful resources that add value to the reader? Does the article link out to other sites? Does the article appear to use keywords effectively? What other tips for improving the content do you have? You should now be able to define best practices of creating optimized content. This will aid you in developing a content creation strategy, optimizing existing content, and creating new content. Throughout the module, you have been able to analyze each of the elements to improve on-page SEO. Since doing this individually can be quite time consuming, I'll show you how to analyze a website all at once. I'll teach you how to use a crawler or spider, specifically one called Screaming Frog, and download that data to an Excel file. After this lesson, you'll be able to understand all of the elements of an on-page SEO strategy and how you can use them in your website analysis. A good way to view information across an entire site is to use what is referred to as a crawler or spider tool. A crawler is a tool that crawls or spiders your website just like a search engine would. This shows you what data it has extracted from the pages of your site. This allows you to get a large scale view of the information we discussed in these lessons. To crawl a website, I recommend a program called Screaming Frog. Screaming Frog is free to use if you crawl up to 500 pages on a site, but you will have to purchase it if you want to crawl more than that. For learning purposes, the free version is fine. Now that we've discussed how to locate title tags, meta descriptions, and heading tags within the pages themselves, let's go over how each of these elements can be viewed on a larger scale. We can do this by using a tool that crawls the site just like a search engine robot would. This site crawler will then show us site-wide information about these important elements. For this example, I am using a crawling tool known as Screaming Frog. You can get a free version of Screaming Frog, which will crawl up to 500 pages per site. But eventually, for working on larger sites, you will want to upgrade to a professional version. Screaming Frog will give us a lot of useful data for our SEO analysis. To begin crawling a site, add the URL here in the search bar, and then hit Start. For this example, I will use UC Davis extension. As the tool begins crawling the site, you can see the progress over here on the right. Note that this progress number may change depending on how many more pages it's finding. The pages the tool has found and crawled will, will be displayed below. You will be able to view the type of content the tool is discovering, such as whether or not this is an HTML page, whether or not it's an image, whether or not it's JavaScript, or other information such as potential PDF files you may have. You can also view any relevant status codes and what those status codes mean. We will discuss this in more depth later on, but take a note now that this is where you can find important status code information. If you scroll to the right, you can see title tags, the length of the title tag, as well as meta descriptions and the length of meta descriptions. 
If you continue to scroll, you would also be able to see heading tags, but you can also use the tabs up here at the top to view this information. If we clicked on the H1 tab, we would be able to see that each of these pages have the main H1 as UC Davis extension, which is the site name, and then a second H1. This also includes the length of the H1. You can view H1 tags, H2 tags, and more in this manner. To analyze these better, I prefer downloading the crawled pages to an Excel file. What you can do is filter the pages just by HTML versions, so you don't have to worry about sorting through images or JavaScript later on. So what you can do is just select HTML and then export. You can't export now because it's still crawling the site. So for right now, we'll just stop the crawl and then export what we have. What you'll then do is you'll name this file the name of your site. So let's just name this UC Davis Extension. And then let's remind ourselves that this is a site crawl. We can then save the file. I'll go ahead and save it to the desktop for now. Once the file is saved, you can open the Excel file and view a list of all of the information it's found. This allows you to more easily filter data and analyze it based on your specific needs. You should now know how to crawl a website and identify important information within that crawl as well as how to download and filter that information for your own analysis. You should now understand how you can crawl a website and view on-page elements across a number of pages all at once. You should also understand how you can download that data and store it in an Excel file.